I'd like to introduce um, Will Brazington, who is the director of the Alumni Association at Clemson, to come forward and introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning, and it's an equal part of privilege of mine to be able to provide an introduction to our featured speaker this morning. Uh, an individual who's provided tremendous representation and outstanding leadership for not only our local community, but in fact our state and nation for the better part of three decades. Uh, in fact, frankly, as I thought about introducing him this morning, I realized I have the task of introducing what I believe is a gentleman who really needs no introduction, but I'll do my best to do justice uh, to it just the same. David H. Wilkins proudly served as United States 21st Ambassador to Canada from June 2005 through January 2009 and was appointed by President George W. Bush. Ambassador Wilkins is widely credited with vastly improving the strength of the U.S.-Canada relationship during his three and a half years of service in Ottawa, applying his three decades of political experience, southern charm, and diplomatic savvy in helping resolve some of the toughest, most high-profile issues between our two great democracies. Ambassador Wilkins is now a partner at Nelson Mullins Rowling Scarborough and chairs the Public Policy and International Law Practice Group. Prior to his appointment as ambassador, Mr. Wilkins practiced law for 34 years here in Greenville and has extensive experience in civil, civil litigation and appellate practice. Of course, he's the former Speaker of the South Carolina House of Representatives, a position he held for 11 years and was a member of the South Carolina House representing District 24 here in Greenville for another quarter century. He currently serves as Chairman of the Board for Clemson University. <coughs> Ambassador Wilkins is a native of Greenville. He and his wife Susan are the proud parents of two sons and two grandchildren. Will you please join me in welcoming to the podium Ambassador David Wilkins. <laughs> Ambassador Wilkins remarks, we have a, a video trip ready to go, which I've had a sneak preview of, I know you'll enjoy. These are tough times, and many Americans south of the border are losing their homes. And here in Ottawa, U.S. Ambassador David Wilkins is about to lose his. Not because a bank is about to foreclose on the U.S. Ambassador's residence, or at least not yet. It's just that once George Bush leaves the White House, Wilkins leaves Canada. Unless, of course, Obama wins and then he seeks political asylum. Let's go inside. Honestly, I can't believe the places I get in sometimes. This is the residence of the U.S. Ambassador, and this is Ambassador David Wilkins. Hello, David. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me here to your house. Well, it's great to have you. I've been wondering when you were going to come visit me. It's I've been nice. asking for years, and it's, you finally came. Well, I, you know, you know the way it is with email sometimes? <laughs> it's a beautiful house. It's a swanky joint. Have you ever been to 24 Sussex? I have. It's, it's a wreck. <laughs> it is. It's falling apart over there. Now see, the American government, you keep your houses up. I gotta say, it's nice. There's no plastic up to the windows, it's good. Now, when you got the call to become ambassador to Canada, is that like a call that you actually want? Is that a hardship post? Is that considered? Are you kidding? No, I'm serious. I, I know, but it's not London. It's a post I asked for. I got interviewed and I, just, and I came, went back home and did my due diligence and looked, number one trading partner, number one export, number one import. So you Googled it. Call back. Yeah. Call back and said, I'll do it if I can go to, to uh, Canada. So they called back. Well, you're from South said, Carolina. Surely to God you didn't know anything about Canada. <laughs> it was. Were you? Yeah. When? Well, when I was a young Army lieutenant and uh, took my bride to, uh, of about six months, we were in Indiana. We went to Niagara Falls, but you know that no, doesn't count. You probably never left the hotel. <laughs> you're right. Six bathrooms. Six or seven. Bring in Joe the plumber for that. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to the top. This is good. With a magnificent view of the Ottawa River. And Very cool. Yeah, no hills. You're like Batman. This is amazing. And it, it magnificent. It's, uh, I think, the prettiest view in, uh, in Ottawa, and the sunsets over here are just 
magnificent. They take your breath away. And you've also, you went around toward the country, the entire country. I love the country. I love the people. You went to every province, every territory? Yeah, many times over. I keep going. Are you, were you really looking for the oil? Were you casing the joint? Cold up here in the winter, though. Yeah, and that, you know that big river right there freezes over. No. Can you, can you believe it? No. In South Carolina, if your dog's water bowl freezes over, you get excited, you bring your kids out, you top it down, it breaks, and you talk to the kids about how cold it must have gotten to do that. Up here, you got whole rivers doing it. Aren't we lucky? <laughs> We're so lucky. It's not the art in the house I've noticed. Most of it's South Carolina, right? Did you go there? That's your alma mater? Uh, Clemson, my alma mater. Oh, Clemson. Yeah. Right. And you went, went to Carolina Law School. Right, now you went to school on a tennis scholarship. I did. College Full tennis. sports scholarship. Free ride. Yeah, yeah I played tennis. We're not very good at that in Canada. Hey, you want to play tennis? Who? You and me. Me? Yeah. No. I'll teach you a few things. <laughs> you, know, you look like Rick Federer. <laughs> Fundamentals. Well, I mean, you're a great athlete, right? Forehand grip, right? Uh -huh. You're shaking hand with the racket. So you yep. shake hand with the racket. Hi, nice to meet you. And then for forehand, you just bring it back mm -hmm. and follow through. And you move your weight from your right to your left. This is what my buddy told me to do. He just said, keep doing this. And yeah. it'll freak him out. You said it. <laughs> All right, we're going to so serve. Don't be nervous. All right, here we're going to serve. We'll okay. serve that way. There you go. Oh, no. Sorry. Kill the cameraman. There you go. You're a natural, man. I think we got to serve that. I like you. I like you. You're diplomatic. Yeah. It's windy out here, though. Yeah, but, but see, don't let the wind get to you. I'm thinking the wind's getting to you. The wind's not getting to me, you know? So I'm thinking but it's going to bother you. I'm cool. I like the wind. You're psyching I me out. I play in the wind, man. I live in the wind. Let's go. He lives in the wind. Yeah, let's go. He lives in, I live in the wind. All right, you're cool. I live, you live in the wind. Cool. I live in the... Yeah. Well, see, you let the wind get to you. Just do this. You're a there you go. You're a natural. That's flat. Let's do You're it. Natural. Let's do it. Huh? Are you betting, man? Well, we'll be today, yeah, for you. Sure. What are we betting? Uh, I don't know what you got, like uh, oil sands? Okay, you win, you get the oil sands, I win, we get Mount Rushmore. That was too rich for you, man. How about a beer? Beer it is. <laughs> it's gone to his head. It's tennis. I mean, he thinks he's good now, huh? <laughs> He's good. He's good. Me. That was the knee. That was the knee. Okay. Okay. All right. We're almost warmed up. <laughs> Ow. Okay. That's good. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Rick. Let's uh, let's call it a tie. We should go say goodbye to Ottawa now. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Can't quit you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Rick. It's been a great day. It's been a great three years. Well, good morning, everyone. I am very honored to be here today. Appreciate the invite. Will, thank you for that very, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, that five minute video that I wanted to share with you uh, did me so much good. Uh, Will in Canada, it's uh, pretty incredible. It was a real diplomatic lesson. Humor often does more, more quickly to break barriers and bring folks together than anything else. It's really the universal language. Uh, I took French when I went to Canada. It didn't take to me. I got about as far as bonjour y'all. Uh, so a little bit of humor went a long way for me uh, in Canada. It also reinforces the fact that you should take your job seriously, you take your responsibilities seriously, just don't take yourself too seriously. Now, I have to confess to you that I have, over the last week or two, gotten a lot of advice <clears throat> about what to talk to all of you about. Uh, advice from Charles Dalton and Seabrook Marchant uh, almost all of it unsolicited, uh, <laughs> some of it good, and I think they probably have decided that it wasn't taken to me, it wasn't, it wasn't absorbing it, because just a few minutes ago, 
uh, before we started, they came up to me and said, David, if you can't make your remarks memorable, at least make them brief. And that's uh, pretty good advice. I'll uh, try to follow that. Uh, I have actually been, been thinking about uh, a lot about what I could say to, say to you this morning that would be meaningful uh, in your lives and your careers. And recognizing that many of you are the current and future leaders uh, of the upstate, I, I decided to take on the daunting task uh, of talking about the topic of leadership. And I readily admit that, that I don't have any uh, secrets or claims of authority on it. Uh, the Greenville Chamber is full of leaders. Uh, and any, any of you, uh, I admit, could be up here right now. Uh, leadership, like beauty, is pretty much in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, that makes it difficult to quantify it, uh, to figure out exactly what makes a good leader. Uh, ask a dozen people what it means to be a leader and you'll get a dozen different definitions. Uh, leaders come in all forms and all shapes, uh, but you always know one when you see one. Now, I know that I'm this ordinary guy from Greenville, South Carolina, who for whatever reason has been blessed with some extraordinary experiences, which in turn have enabled me to meet and interact with some really amazing people. And they've taught me a lot about leadership. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like to share some of their stories with you. And I hope they inspire you as they have inspired me. You know, all this focus on leadership got Susan and me reminiscing a little bit uh, a couple of days ago and talking about the people we've been privileged to call friends over the years from presidents to prime ministers. And I was going on and on about Susan. Can you believe that I got to be Speaker of the House for 11 years? Can you believe that, that, that we did this and we did that? And in your wildest dreams, did you ever think we'd be ambassador to Canada? And in your wildest dreams, did you ever think we'd get to be friends with George and Laura Bush? And I guess I got a little carried away because finally Susan looked up and said, David, you are never in my wildest dreams. Uh, she, uh, she, she has a way of uh, keeping me grounded and keeping me humble. I remember the second day back from Canada, Susan said, we need to take out the garbage. That's Susan speak for, you need to go take out the garbage. And, and I said, well, Susan, you realize I haven't taken out the garbage for four years? And she said, David, surely you haven't forgotten how. Um, so maybe talking about garbage is a good way, good place to start because I'm guessing most of us would say we look for humility in our leaders. And it seems like that's a characteristic often in short supply these days. The Bible tells us in the ninth chapter of Mark, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. But for anyone who ever has held a leadership post, you know it's pretty tall order to act with humility when you're in charge. I mean you're after all, you're leading the way. Success demands you project an image of strength, of being worthy of that fancy title attached to your name. Now that's hard enough if you're in Congress, or if you're running a business, or president of an organization. But just think the caliber of person it takes to be a humble warrior. And that's exactly why my friend, why, what my friend General Rick Hilliard is and why I admire him so much. Rick Hillier was Canada's chief of the defense staff. That's Canada's equivalent to the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chief of Staff. And when it came to going after terrorists in Afghanistan, immediately and without hesitation, Canada was with us every step of the way. In fact, in the fall of 2001, only weeks after the terror attacks, Canadian commandos hunting Al-Qaeda were some of the first boots on the ground in Afghanistan. But back in the days when the fighting, when fighting the war on terror was most intense in Afghanistan, when Canadian heroes were coming home in body bags, a skeptical Canadian public that relished his image as the global peacekeeper needed assurance. And always there was General Rick Hilliard. He's credited almost single-handedly with changing Cana Canadians' opinions of their military, restoring morale, and well-deserved well pride in Canadian forces. He is persuasive, unstoppable, can-do optimism, 
and his relentless drive to make sure his troops got all the credit inspired an entire nation. General Herriot never wasted a day blaming anyone for anything. And he never met a challenge he wasn't ready, prepared to tackle personally. Because Rick understood the best leaders are truly the most faithful servants. Sometimes leadership is about finding compromise and common ground. Sometimes it's about giving no ground at all and inspiring others to join you there. But more than anything else, I think leadership is having, is having the wisdom and the courage to know the difference. He was the ultimate soldier, soldier, soldier. Just a guy from Newfoundland who rose to the ranks and truly lived the old cliche, he never forgot where he came from. In fact, it was his humble roots that gave him such mighty wings. And I saw this leader in action firsthand. The, the most memorable trip I will ever take in my life was the week I spent in Afghanistan at Christmas time 2007 with General Heria to thank the Canadian forces for their service and sacrifice. And on that star-filled Christmas Eve seven years ago, I walked with General here to the outer guard post of a Canadian forward operating post in the middle of the desert. Most desolate place you could ever imagine. And for two hours, I witnessed going from one guard post to another. I witnessed here inspire and encourage his troops. He had each one convinced they were the most important part of all Canadian forces. There's an old proverb on leadership that says, he who thinks he leads but has no followers is only taking a walk. General Heary would take it one step further and say, you can only lead if you're willing to walk alongside your troops. Sending troops into battle has got to be an agonizing decision for any leader. And I know it was for President George W. Bush. Bush had been in office for less than eight months when those planes were hijacked September 11, 2001, taking with them so many precious lives and the illusion that we Americans were safe in our own country. The events of that murderous day definitely altered the course of the Bush presidency. Now I will leave it to history and to each of you to judge, yourself, to judge for yourselves the Bush administration's handling of the war on terror. But certainly how a wartime president conducts himself always off, offers interesting perspectives on leadership. And I did get that chance, along with my son Robert, to visit with President Bush in the Oval Office exactly six weeks after 9-11. And it was a conversation I'll never forget. Because what was so clear was the President's heart was breaking just like the rest of us. The difference was the rest of us were counting on him to do something, to somehow right this terrible wrong. And in that Oval Office that day, I found a man who was certainly not elected to be a wartime president, but one who was prepared to shoulder it. And he told us about his day on 9-11, and then about visiting the families of the victims in New York a few days later. He told me 9-11 was the defining moment of his presidency. He hoped the American people would stay with him, but whether they did or not, his main mission was to protect and defend America and bring the terrorists to justice, and he would do just that. Now, I have to confess to you that he used a little more colorful language uh, in describing uh, bringing the terrorists to justice, uh, which I won't repeat uh, today. Ernest Hemingway said, courage is grace under pressure. And I know that's something we all look for in a leader. And I remember telling Susan after the meeting, I was struck with the president's lack of anxiety at the moment. Because you remember back, we were, back then, we were all a bundle of nerves. And the president told Robert and me that he felt the nation praying for him, and he felt sustained and buoyed by those prayers. And I believed it. And it was strange because what I wanted to really do is to tell him that Susan and me and the communities all over this country were, were pulling for him and praying for him uh, and hoping he and War were doing okay and praying for the entire leadership team and trying to make him feel better. 
But I left the White House feeling better. And it struck me that that's what leaders do. They reassure you on difficult days. They remain steady at the wheel during tough times. Now, unfortunately, George W. Bush is just one of many leaders to confront the evil of their time. We're all watching history unfold today in the Ukraine. Perhaps most disturbing are reports of anti-Semitism on the rise there. And my friend David Shintow knows all about that. I met Mr. Shintow and his wife Rose in Ottawa when I spoke at a synagogue. And he told me he wanted to show me something. And I said, sure. And so he rolled up his sleeve and revealed to me the horror that time could not erase. 72585. The number the Nazis had roughly tattooed on his arm as a teenager. Mr. Shintow was his family's lone survivor of Hitler's death camps. For years, he was enslaved and starved. In April 1945, he lay unconscious, welcoming death. But it was life that was delivered to him that day in the form of an American GI. Mr. Shintow told me all these decades later, the memories of that horror are still fresh. He still gets nightmares. But always the face of that American GI shines through like an angel. And that face, the face of freedom, the one symbolized of what Mr. Shintow calls as his birthday, is the face of the United States of America. In his mid-80s today, it would be so easy for him, so much less painful, to leave those awful years behind him, to bear the memories, to move on. But David and Rose Shintow had devoted their lives to the retelling of David's story again and again. To school children and community and governmental groups, wherever there are sets of ears. He relives and retells every brutal memory. Because you see, history has a nasty way of repeating itself. And Mr. Shintow knows we build museums, we make vows to never forget, but they were in, East, in Eastern Ukraine. So Mr. Shintow tells this story. Because if not him, who knows and has been there, then who? If not now, then when? And Mr. Shintow reminds me that leaders don't always come draped in flags or medals like presidents or generals. Sometimes leaders are born of the deepest wounds. Their scars, like Mr. Shintow's tattoo, a testament to their survival. They become leaders in hopes of helping others avoid the places they've been. And so they shine a light in the darkness. Other leaders rise to the top simply because there is a need. And our community is abundantly blessed with these kind of leaders, from school teachers to coaches and mentors. Leadership is not about the position you hold. It's not about the plaques on the wall. It's about the people you touch. Now, being U.S. Ambassador to Canada was truly the privilege of a lifetime. I got to wake up every single morning for almost four years and say to myself, hey, big boy, today you get to represent the United States of America. Don't screw this thing up. <laughs> for decades, the softwood lumber this trade dispute between the U.S. and Canada had raised at a fever pitch. One lawsuit had followed another. The Canadian government was highly critical of the tariffs that the U.S. had placed on their lumber coming in to our country. And six months after I arrived there, there was a national election and a new government came into power for the first time in 12 years and with that, a new prime minister. A month later, Prime Minister Stephen Harper met with President George Bush. And Harper told Bush that the lumber trade dispute was his number one issue. And it was very important to him for it to be resolved. And the President asked me about it and how to solve it. It was obvious to me he wanted to help this new Prime Minister if he could. 
And I told him I couldn't tell him about all the nuances that had to be worked out. I would leave that up to USTR and our trade negotiators. But I did tell him that if we wanted Canada to be our very best friend in the world, then we would find a way to solve this issue. Because this one issue was having a negative impact on our entire bilateral relationship. And the president was decisive. He resolved right then and there to make it happen. And three months later, the Saltwood Lumber Agreement between our two countries was signed, ending the decades-long trade dispute, and it is still in effect today. Relationships matter. It took two leaders at the top developing a relationship built on trust to get it done. And frankly, I'm concerned that that foundation of trust between our two countries is being eroded as Canada continues to wait on our current U.S. administration to make a decision on the Keystone XL pipeline. After waiting now for more than five long years, Canada frankly deserves better from its best friend and trading partner. Former Secretary of State Colin Powell observed trust is the essence of leadership. And time and time again, over 25 years of the legislature, I found that to be so true. A less than great idea proposed by a respected, well-liked member in the legislature always went further in that process than a great idea proposed by someone who was not as well-liked or trusted. How you treat people matters. And whether you're at home or at work, in the office of a diplomat or a doctor, folks are far more impressed by a kind word and a promise kept than by your credentials or titles. <clears throat> now that's not to say the substance doesn't matter. After all, someone who's all hat and no cattle doesn't accomplish very much. And one of the most impressive people I think I will ever have the privilege of meeting and working with is Dr. Condoleezza Rice. She was Secretary of State, my boss, when I was Ambassador to Canada. And though small in physical statute, Condoleezza Rice is truly larger than life. She's an intellectual giant, a Russian scholar, an accomplished pianist, not to mention a hardcore, avid NFL fan. But it, what is always most impressive about Condi Rice is that she is always, always prepared. And I was probably in a, double, uh, in a dozen diplomatic meetings uh, with Rice, either in Canada or in Washington, during my time as ambassador, meeting either with the Prime Minister of Canada or with her equivalent called the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I remember one meeting in Ottawa uh, with the former government before there was a change, early in my tenure, and we were meeting there with the Prime Minister and they were very much opposed to the U.S. drilling uh, in the Anwar region of, of Alaska, drilling for oil. We were, we were, the Bush administration was proposing that, trying to get permission from Congress. Canada was very much opposed to it uh, on the basis that it would affect the caribou herd that roamed up there between Canada and Alaska. And I got ready to interject because I was pretty much up to speed on that issue. And, and uh, Secretary of State uh, Rice on motion for me to stand down and there was a map on the table and she pointed out to the Canadians where they were drilling in Canada, which was pretty close to where we were drilling in Alaska. And she said, you know, it's always been curious to me, Mr. Prime Minister, why your drilling doesn't bother the caribou, but our drilling does. And that was sort of the end of the conversation about that. Um, I truly am grateful of every encounter I had with Condi Rice because always left her feeling challenged, challenged to work a little harder, to put in a few more minutes, to read just a few more pages. In my experiences at the State Department, Dr. Rice was always self-assured and confident and could effectively engage on the most remote issues because she was familiar with it. She put in the time because that's what leaders with substance do. So for me, 
when you put all these stories together and boil it down from what I've observed over the years, it all comes down to this. To be an effective, impactful leader, you have to be a leader worth following. Maybe it's uh, because I have grandchildren now or that I'm privileged as chairman of Clemson's Board of Trustees to sit through a whole lot of graduations and see thousands of hopeful young men and women chomping at the bit to step on that first rung of the leadership ladder. That I see leadership these days not so much as a talent one possesses, but rather as a gift one has to give. In short, leaders worth following are making things better in a tangible way for the people around them. And you usually see the greatest impact at the local level. So as we get ready to celebrate the upcoming birthday of our great nation, a land God so richly blessed with a bounty of smart and courageous leaders who laid for us a bedrock of liberty, maybe each of us should be pondering for ourselves. Am I making things better for the people who follow? Whether it be my family, my business, or my community. How each of us answers that question and then acts upon that answer could start a leadership legacy right here, right now, at the Greenville Chamber Friday forward. May it be so. Thanks for inviting me to share this time with you. God, may God richly bless each of you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for taking the time to come out and speak to us this morning. That, that was certainly uh, words of encouragement and, and certainly you know what you're talking about when it comes to leadership. Uh, we do have a few extra minutes here uh, and he uh, has agreed to take a few questions. Um, do we have questions for Ambassador Wilkins? <laughs> what? <clears throat> since, since the chamber is nonpartisan, uh, you know, I, and that's it's going to be really interesting to see what, what transpires. And I don't know any more about it than, than any of you all do. Um, obviously, on the Republican side, it is totally wide open. Um, Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Clinton, certainly seems to be the the one everybody's assuming will be the Democratic nominee if she runs. It certainly looks like with a book, book tour and other things that she's running, but uh, who knows. But I think after this election this fall, uh, you know, the things will start clearing up and you'll, see, you'll know pretty soon whether or not she's definitely running. If she does, I think she clear, pretty well clears the field on the Democratic side and then you've probably got a half a dozen Republicans that could, a lot of uh, governors, uh, one interesting thing from Canada, the U.S. You know, it seems like governors oftentimes are candidates for our presidency. Uh, this past time that was not the case with two, uh, well, Romney was a governor, but uh, of course the, the president when he uh, got elected was a, was a U.S. senator. And when he ran against McCain, you had for what was some of the first times uh, two senators running against each other. In Canada, they have provinces, same thing as states, basically 13 of them. They have premiers, same thing as the governor. No premier has ever been um, I know this is not answering your question, but no, no premier has ever been uh, Prime Minister of Canada. They are so regionalized, a, a premier in Alberta would never be able to get votes in Quebec. Premier in Quebec, representing their people, would never, they're more regionalized than we are. Um, so that, that's an interesting comparison of two great democracies side by side doing a little bit differently. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who's going to be the Republican. I don't think anybody, if anybody tells you who's going to be the Republican, they either don't know what they're talking about or lying to you because nobody knows. Uh, you got about half a dozen of them. Uh, Jeb Bush is taking a serious look at it now. He say, says he'll decide by the end of the year. You got Perry, Perry's back going all over the country. You've got uh, Jingle. Uh, you, you got two or three of them from the Wisconsin governor. You got, you know, you, don't know if the New Jersey governor will be able to come back from from his issue, but uh, you know you got at least half a dozen in the middle that'll. 
put their toe in the water and see, uh, see how it is. And by the way, Tim, I love the way you uh, wear your hair. <laughs> we do. Well, the short answer is, see Will Brazelton after this, because he can tell you more about Clemson than I can. But we want to engage with Greenville. And so see me, write me, email. We'll put you in touch with the right people to answer all those questions. We, we think Greenville is very important to us. We, we are, obviously, it, it didn't just happen that we're on Main Street. We're on Main Street for a reason. We want Greenville to be our town. We want to be an integral part of Greenville. We're holding some of our uh, trustee meeting, our trustee retreat uh, in July is going to be a Greenville one. We want to be downtown. We want to be seen. Um, and we're very, we're very proud of that. And um, uh, with, of course, with ICAR here, um, but, but we, we, Clemson wants to be part of the economic engine for South Carolina. And we want to help entrepreneurs. We want to help people get involved in creating businesses. So we got people over there that are experts in doing that. Please, please uh, send me an email, or get in touch with me, and I'll get you in touch with the right folks. Yes. Uh, I want to ask a question. How can uh, the Chamber's main goal for the last couple of years has been to raise per capita incomes because we, a rising tide uh, would lift all the boats. What can we do in Greenville County, whether it's County Council or the City of Greenville or Clemson University, whoever, what can we do to raise uh, the tide, uh, the level of education in Greenville and promote economic development? Fred, I could turn that, I could turn, I'll turn that question around and ask each of you, because I think folks like you and, and uh, Leighton Cubbage and others can answer that better than I can, certainly the, the chamber folks. I mean, I, I think uh, the chamber does a terrific job, uh, GADC does a terrific job of trying to attract people to Greenville. Greenville's got so much to, to offer now with our downtown. I mean, we just, and we're getting the word out. I think uh, with our governor, who's done a great job of attracting industries, just trying to locate them in areas that are, that are more depressed than we are in Greenville, uh, I just had big announcements uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I don't have, I don't have, I think all of us is working together with the same goal, creating the jobs, uh, in increasing the, um, the level of education we have in Greenville, um, and make, make it a, a more attractive place to locate your, your family here. We've got a big, uh, I know there are different views on it. Uh, I support it. We've got a big referendum on, on roads coming up here pretty soon. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm proud, we've got a long ways to go, but I'm sure proud of the, the road we've traveled so far, particularly uh, in Greenville County. Yes. Sir, what is the, uh, in your opinion, is the biggest challenge facing South, South Carolina State, or more specifically, Greenville and the community around it? I need Knox White or <laughs> Nikki Hayden. Ask me about Canada, man, I got that. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, uh, I, I, I don't think it's any different than it's always been. I mean, we, just, we want to raise the quality of life. We want to make it attractive for people to locate. We want, we want more businesses to locate here. We want more entrepreneurs to locate here, more businesses to be created here. I think we're doing a good job. We can always do more. Um, but I, I don't have any, any magic uh, silver bullet on that. Uh, I, I, it does take folks like you getting involved and uh, the chamber's getting involved and working together collaboratively with the upstate. Um, I see it every day. I think we could always, always, I always think you'd always do better, but I'm very proud of the effort that so many of you make on that. But I don't have any, any special, I don't have any answer you don't already know, I promise you that. David, uh, having traveled around and been in Canada, I know at one time the reputation of South Carolina was not great, and I think that's changing. How are you seeing our reputation in South Carolina being seen across the country? I, I, I think I can confidently say that people in Canada know more about us uh, now than they did 10 years ago. 
When I first got there, they, uh, they, knew, they, heard, they knew about Myrtle Beach. A lot of them went there, but that's about it. <laughs> they have Canadian. I told them, I said, yeah, you're the only guys in March out in the water. We call you polar bears. Um, but I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of Canadians that are down there. Well, I think it's the first or second week of March. Uh, more and more of them are coming down. They now know about Greenville, South Carolina. They sure know about Clemson Tigers. I got, I got friends in Canada that follow Clemson as close as I do now. So, and I've, I've had about half a dozen down to see the games. Um, but, and, and Nikki Haley, uh, to her credit, did a uh, trade mission trip to Canada about a month ago. I was privileged to go with her. We went to Toronto and then uh, uh, Ottawa, and then uh, she met with the Prime Minister, and then uh, uh, went to Montreal. Um, you got TD Bank, big presence down here now. She visited with their uh, CEO uh, in Toronto. Uh, we've got a lot of Canadians in South Carolina now, a lot of Canadian companies. and. You know, I think we're, we're making a, a good impression. Uh, we're, we're competing with everybody else. I mean, uh, all the southeastern states have trade offices in Canada. Uh, Tennessee has had one for years. Georgia has one. Um, it's um, South, uh, Canada is South Carolina's largest trade park. Sometimes it's Germany, depending on how many cars we ship, right? But sometimes, but for 36 states, Canada is the number one trading park. Uh, and it's usually first or second with South Carolina, only when Germany is first, Canada second, and vice versa. Uh, but they're hugely important to us. All right, well, why don't we do one more question? If there is any, about, we'll wish everybody a happy Friday and thank you all for. Yes, sir. Yeah, one quick question. You mentioned several leaders uh, that you admire in the political spectrum. Uh, but knowing that you're a big sports fan, particularly Clemson, is there anybody in the You know, I, I, I don't want Carolina fans to walk out of here grumbling under their breath saying, <laughs> but, but I really admire Dabo Swing. I think he's the real deal. Um, I don't know him real well, but I've been around him enough to form a pretty good opinion. And I think, he, I think he's the real deal. I think what you see is what you get. I think he's genuine. I think he's a motivator, obviously. I think he can be inspirational. Um, I'm, I really feel good about the Clemson overall, I think, I think our new president uh, is, a good, is a very good leader, Jim Clemens. Um, I've seen him now uh, in action for six months. He's, a, he's got good people skills. I mean, you know, you all know as well as I do, you, you get people to like you and then you can get things done, right? You gotta be, but you gotta have some people skills and you gotta make the effort. Uh, he's got great people skills, he's got good vision. I've seen him make decisive decisions on the spur of the moment that had to be made. Uh, so. You know, I hate to, I hate to be, I'm not saying Carolina doesn't have it. I just, I'm closer to Clemson. I see that firsthand. Um, but that's a, that's a good, I hadn't thought about that. But locally, those are two people. And they're, you know what, they're probably all of you. I mean, there's leadership all over Green. We're, we're blessed. And all over the upstate. Thank you all for having me. Happy Friday. <laughs>